Our next demonstration will be given by Dr. Gregory Birch, President and CEO of Halomine Incorporated. The topic of their demonstration is Next Generation Wound Therapeutics. The company will have 20 minutes to demonstrate their technology, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. And when you're ready to begin, we will start the clock. Thank you. Um, well, in preparing for the event today, um, I had a long conversation with uh, our medical um, advisor, and he said that the easiest part of your job will be to convey the benefit of uh, improving morbidity and mortality um, among our troops. And uh, so that's what our company is doing. We have a new therapeutic um, agent, a uh, new wound dressing compound um, that provides a lot of benefit uh, for, for, the, uh, for the battlefield. So um, in reviewing data on battlefield statistics, we've, uh, we've identified, we understand that um, our medical combat teams are doing an outstanding job at, at uh, improving um, outcomes for wounded warriors. And um, there is, however, one, one area that seems to be an opportunity, and that's in the area of infection control. Um, the uh, statistics indicate that with uh, uh, particularly blast trauma um, and gunshot wounds, that uh, there's a one in four chance um, of a casualty or a patient acquiring an infection, uh, an asymptomatic infection. And that, in fact, increases by about twofold with regard to burns and burn injuries. And unfortunately, of those particular patients, about one in two uh, runs the risk of acquiring a uh, drug-resistant infection, which, of course, then becomes much more difficult um, to treat. And one of the... Um, the interesting factors today is that our, the strategy is to essentially employ a, uh, a golden hour, uh, st stabilize the patient and evacuate the patient within 60 minutes strategy. And so within 60 minutes that, that uh, patient is returned to a, uh, an office or a, a facility that's pretty well equipped and we still see this kind of problem. Uh, one of the issues is that uh, right now the, the treatment methods that we use um, are standard gauze, um, maybe a standard injection of an antibiotic, but a lot of these, um, these strategies really date back to the 80s, and so we're, uh, we're using some pretty old techniques to try to combat this problem. So, um, so the, the systems are out of date. Uh, we have... Uh, a, a methodology of evacuation that requires a 60-minute kind of time frame. And unfortunately, what the Army is looking for is to go to a different paradigm. Um, in the future, we're looking at the, the potential of uh, having to provide uh, uh, field care, prolonged field care of up to 72 hours. Um, and this is also potentially in austere environments uh, where evacuation is going to become very, very difficult. And interestingly, um, DARPA um, has, has been working on some really uh, fascinating technology. Um, and they're trying to uh, utilize a concept called biostasis. And this is public information, so you, know, you probably have uh, encountered it already. But biostasis is essentially a, a, a methodology of slowing down the biological functions of the body, uh, much like a hibernation process. And so the patient then can uh, essentially be kept um, alive for a lot longer period of time um, until they can be returned or evacuated into a, an equipped facility. Um, the unfortunate part about that is that um, the pathogens aren't able to be slowed down. They continue to grow. So in order for that to really be effective, we have to figure out a way to also slow down the pathogen risk. And so that's a problem that, uh, among other things, our company uh, can solve. So I want to jump back and talk a little bit about who we are. So Halamine um, is a spin-off company out of Cornell. Uh, we're only a year old. We were formed in 2018. And we are focused on um, commercializing some antimicrobial technology that was developed at Cornell um, that has high, higher efficacy and lower costs than a lot of the current uh, solutions that are out there. 
Um, our products are uh, also very well suited for a number of industries, including healthcare and also food processing. Our technology is, uh, has been licensed for, from Cornell and also from Auburn University. Um, and we have a pretty strong partnership with Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, who's been providing a lot of our um, guidance in terms of animal trials and also uh, regulatory affairs. Um, and we've also gotten support financially, of course, from XTEC Search, which we're very grateful for. But then uh, we've also just recently been awarded a CIBR for, uh, from the USDA uh, that focuses on a uh, food processing project. Uh, finally, we've gotten some support from the state of New York um, in a competition called Launch New York. So jumping back to the problem, um, there's a tremendous amount of research, of course, on wounds and wound infections. And all indicators point to the significant problem of biofilms and how to treat it. And the research really points to the fact that the best way to treat biofilms is to intercept it before it really has an opportunity to, to, to get a hold. Um, and so if you look just briefly at how a biofilm is established, um, initially uh, the biofilm starts with just some uh, fairly, uh, call it small or innocuous uh, uh, infection or pathogen loads. Um, and this, in a typical trauma case, um, such as a blast or gunshot wound situation, would come from, from the initial entry of whatever the article was, whatever the penetration um, article um, came from. And the standard treatment at point of injury would be to pack this wound, um, and the term is packed to the bone. And so uh, the, uh, the combat medic would arrive, they would essentially load gauze in a very aggressive fashion into the wound and uh, with virtual certainty uh, contaminate that wound with a pretty significant load of, of, of organisms, bacteria. And so the progression then, or the, the uh, period of time of only 48 hours goes from this uh, environmental load of bacteria to something that colonizes in a much more significant way and then starts to develop a biofilm, which is a protective mucus-like coating um, that really uh, enhances the ability of these bacteria to protect themselves. And at that point, it becomes a very persistent uh, problem to deal with. Um, and it only takes 48 hours for this biofilm to become fully mature. And once that happens, there are a couple of other risks. One is that the biofilm can be infected with drug-resistant organisms or it can develop a drug-resistant uh, capability. And second, the biofilm can uh, fragment um, and produce uh, other elements that can go into the body and create other infections in other areas, like sepsis, for example. So in order to solve a very difficult problem, you need a, a team of subject matter experts, and that's, that's who we have on our team. Uh, the, uh, uh, the technology side um, is, is really come from uh, Dr. Mingyu Chow and Dr. Mingling Ma, both from the Cornell Bioengineering and Environmental uh, Engineering Department. And uh, they're both experts in both antimicrobial science and in halamine science and also biological materials and coatings. Um, in addition to those two, uh, myself, Greg Birch, and Ted Eveleth are, uh, are the entrepreneurs. Together, we have about uh, 30 years plus of engineering experience, uh, or I'm sorry, entrepreneurial experience. Um, and uh, so we have a pretty good handle, or we have a pretty good breadth of capability when it comes to scale up, particularly in technology and bioscience. In addition to us, we have a group of advisors that's very strong. Um, I mentioned Dr. Stephen Thomas is our chief medical advisor, uh, along with Holly Chinatri, and they are at Upland Medical University at Syracuse. Um, Gerlin Vander Vanderwall is our uh, infectious control expert and also is very experienced in animal trials and, and uh, performing animal studies for FDA approval. And then we have another team at uh, Auburn University, a uh, team of scientists and some business advisors as well. So we started out um, with the initial product concept and it was very simple. We thought we would essentially take a um, 
a straightforward common off-the-shelf gauze, put some antimicrobial compound on it, and we would have a product. Um, and we, um, we also were smart enough to have gone through, or fortunate enough to have gone through the NSF i process. And so we knew about customer discovery. And so we had an opportunity uh, to talk to a number of uh, people with regard to user patterns. Um, so we talked to different uh, combat medical people. We talked to other emergency um, response teams to really get a sense of what a, uh, what a, a next generation gauze technology might look like. We also had an opportunity to interact with uh, a number of really, um, uh, I guess, instrumental thought leading folks within Walter Reed and also the USA MMDA. Um, and we had a chance to attend some, some uh, conferences uh, that are related to this subject matter. And we learned um, some very significant things. Now, that allowed us to change our ideal criteria of this gauze uh, and expand what we really needed to do. So we, we determined that we needed to have uh, a gauze that prevented biofilms and, sh and shielded the wounds from future infection. It had to remain in place for 72 hours without having the need to be changed or removed, which is a pretty significant challenge. And it had to have hemostatic action. It had to obviously be safe, um, shelf stable, and cost effective and easy to use. Um, another criteria that we realized in, in talking to um, these experienced combat medics is that uh, we couldn't add any content to the, the bag. We couldn't come up with something new. It had to fit within the, the current profile of what they're using today. So that criteria was also added to our, uh, our product. The, the product that we came up with is called HaloCare. And HaloCare really is a combination of four different features. First of all, there's an enhalamine antimicrobial technology. And enhalamines use chlorine as a basis of action. And they're able to store this chlorine in a very safe and stable fashion, but they have an interaction or a reaction with uh, with microorganisms that causes the chlorine to release, and at that point it behaves a lot like bleach. So they have a lot of the kill characteristics of bleach without some of the problems and toxicity. We also realized that in order to remain in place uh, in, the, uh, in the field for 72 hours, we need to protect the gauze itself from being contaminated. And so we needed to add an anti-fouling component to the material. And so this anti-fouling uh, material um, is repellent of different um, biological particles uh, like proteins, carbohydrates, and also cells. And you can see in the picture that the, the uh, material, the coupon on the, the upper right is almost clear. So none, it has no staining, no adhesion of any blood products. And the other uh, control samples are, are fairly well stained. So our team um, also combined these technologies with a proprietary chemistry to polymerize this product and create a coating, and also confirm that it was compatible with the hemostatic agents that are in, uh, in use today. So here is uh, our list of advantages for HaloCare. I'm not gonna read through these, but essentially um, this material accomplishes a lot of our Criteria goals, uh, it's broad spectrum and potent. It does not induce any microbial resistance. It has the anti-fouling characteristics. Um, it also has an advantage of maintaining a moisture environment because it's a very hydrophilic coating. And it seamlessly incorporates into a lot of common materials that are used today. And finally, uh, we realize that it's 1 30th the cost of silver, which is a common alternative for antimicrobials that um, that the Army, I know, has used um, to some degree. So, uh, so this profile checks all the boxes of our ideal design criteria. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And the next portion of our work uh, with regard to the capstone was to validate our product and do a proof of concept. So we created a validation plan that included a test of biofilm prevention a test of antimicrobial efficacy. Uh, we tested the safety of the product. We also confirmed that it retained its hemostasis capability, and we verified its shelf stability. So the first test that I want to talk about is the biofilm prevention test. 
And these are two separate tests. We use a standard protocol that's widely published that I'm happy to share with you at some other point. But the gist of the test is to expose these materials to different cell loads and protein loads, and then to uh, use fluorescent tags uh, to determine what kind of adhesion you have. And so uh, in this case, you don't want to see nice colorful images. You want to see black boring images. And in the case of the halo care technology uh, test on the left, you can see the control surface is bright green, which indicates a lot of protein adhesion, whereas the um, halo care product is black. So nothing um, has stuck to it. The test on the right is a cell adhesion test, and same concept. The, uh, the control surface is loaded with bacteria after being exposed and incubated for a period of time. There's no in inhibition of growth, but the health care technology is clear. There's nothing growing. So same concept here, only instead of a uh, two-dimensional test, this is a three-dimensional test that we used and uh, took some data with a confocal microscope. And so again, this is a boring image, but boring is good in our case. That's what we want to see. There's a live dead stain that we've used here. Um, the live dead stain turns live cells green and dead cells red. And so what you're seeing are small spots of red dead cells and no green live cells. And again, very sparse. So that's a successful test. So the next test that we performed was a sandwich test. And this is an antimicrobial efficacy test where we expose uh, a, uh, the surfaces to specific loads of bacteria and we measure how many we kill within a certain period of time. The bottles or jars that you see on the lower part of the screen are samples that we received from Walter Reed um, and they are, uh, they are organisms that came directly from patients, isolated from patients. And so these are the results. And you can see on the left, control samples um, showed really very little effect when exposed um, to, uh, to these different organisms. On the far right, you see HaloCare uh, within five minutes virtually completely eliminated all of, the, all of the bacteria. There is one line that you see there in orange, which is a candida, which is actually, if you've heard of candida auris, it's, a, it's an emerging threat. Um, it's a fungus, and it's a little bit different animal, so we also wanted to test that. And we did very well against Candida auris. Um, in the middle, we compared the results to silver, which is, again, a standard product that's used today. And silver um, was not nearly as, as well in performance, which is one of the reasons that it's not a good biofilm um, uh, controlling or inhibiting candidate. We did another test. Similarly, we created a cocktail of different organisms just to, to make sure that uh, we had the same results with a mixture versus individual bacteria. So we, we produced a cocktail of 14 different cells or different cell types, and we performed the same test, um, exposing the, uh, the surfaces to, uh, to various loads of bacteria over various times. And you can see in this control that we have a lot of growth over five minutes, 15 minutes, and 30 minutes uh, without any sort of, uh, of halogel coating. And then with the HaloCare um, efficacy coating, we have no growth, even at five minutes of exposure. Next, we wanted to just verify that the hemostatic um, functionality of the, of the product was not affected. And you can see here that that's the case on the left. We still have a lot of hemostatic activity with exposure of our halo care material. We wanted to test the storage stability, um, knowing that this product was, not, was going to need to be uh, transported, stored in some very challenging environments, maybe hot weather, cold weather. Uh, we have not done the extreme conditions yet. That's our part of our future planning, but we have done a little bit of testing with you know, with the time that we had in the lab environment. And after 30 days, we don't see any degradation of performance of the material. We're comparing that to the blue line, which is a previous version, which had some very good stability, so we have confidence that this new product will also perform in a similar fashion. Next, we did some uh, testing on human safety of the, of the product. And the 
the ultimate goal is to do large animal in vitro testing or in vivo testing, sorry, within uh, within an infection control model or actually induce infections in large animals. But to get to that point, we need to first go through the cell-based petri dish tests and then trans transition into uh, an initial small animal mouse test to demonstrate that we have not introduced anything that creates harm. So in the cell test, you can see that the hallow care viability, um, again, compared to silver, is much more safe or does not have nearly the cell impact that the silver compound has. Um, and that's in uh, a test with human fibroblasts. There, uh, there's also a test here of uh, skin epidermal cells, and this test is a little bit different. It compares um, our performance to a negative control and a positive control. And in this case, <clears throat> the uh, Halo Care product performed very close to um, the same as the, as the negative control, indicating no toxicity. So we performed um, an initial mouse test, as I said. We did this with the help of Walter Reed and also with the help of Cornell uh, Baker Animal Institute. And we created standard wounds. Again, this, the test was based on published literature. So we created standard wounds in a certain mouse population, and we measured the response. And over the course of 10 days, we had very similar performance with the uh, Halo Care treated product as we did with the controls. We also did some histology tests, which is on the lower left-hand side. And at a cellular level, you can also see that the wound healing process was progressing in a very similar manner for both, both uh, tests. So the outcome of that is that we, uh, we see no effect um, of, uh, no negative effect of the Halo Care product versus the control. So last, I want to close with our transition plan. And we have uh, five key, care, key considerations that we are, are looking to, to resolve or consider uh, in our transition. So we need to define our product profile. And what that means at this stage is we need to determine what kinds of label claims ultimately we want to have for our, our product. And, Label claims in this case could range anywhere from something that accelerates wound healing or something that, uh, that controls biofilm or something that kills pathogens at a certain rate. And so whatever we claim, we're going to have to go through a lot of scrutiny with the FDA process to demonstrate. Uh, so it's important that we designate that correctly up front. Um, the other consideration here is the civilian market. As you can tell, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity with this technology to go beyond just the, the Army and the Department of Defense. Um, and so we need to uh, consider that. We also need to consider our clinical trials and our scale up. So this is uh, our commercialization plan. And I don't anticipate that you can read this. But the important thing is that we've accomplished a number of things that we set out to do um, early on in the initial X-Tech search uh, plan. and. With the next phase, uh, we will be looking at validating this product through animal trials and preclinical trial tests. We estimate the cost of this uh, validation phase to be $188,000. Finally, our product roadmap, we have um, started. We have decided to start with a hemostatic biofilm fighting gauze, but there's also a tremendous opportunity in addressing burns with a hydrogel-like product. Uh, we can also use this technology in negative pressure wound therapy foams. Um, and again, this would allow the actual dressing to remain in place for a much longer period of time. And then finally, there's a market for surgical films, which could potentially uh, combat a big, big problem, particularly in the private sector, but also in the Department of Defense of surgical site infections, which are very problematic. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will entertain questions. Uh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, you mentioned potential for accelerating healing. Have you actually conducted any of those tests? We. 
the closest we've come is actually with the mouse test model that we created. And the basis in literature says that hydrogel type compounds that maintain a moist, the right level of moist environment um, have been shown to accelerate healing. And this is a, a characteristic or a property that our technology can possess. In fact, we'll, we can show some, um, some samples here after um, we, we conclude here. But, but yes, we believe that's a strong potential. We've seen a little bit of evidence in the histology, but I can't claim that we have a strong case yet. And then you also mentioned the compatibility with different hemostatic agents. Have you actually conducted those tests? Is there any change to the effectiveness of the hemostatics? Yeah, we, in the next phase, we need to quantify that better, but we've tested it. There are two types um, that are common. One is called a kaolin, and the other is a chitosin. And we've tested compatibility in both types. We've tested not only the hemostatic performance visually, but we've looked at that under uh, instrumentation, FTIR. Um, to demonstrate that molecularly we're not introducing any changes to the chemistry. So you showed some statistics, so I'm going to ask the t statistic that matters uh, to me. When, when switching from one product to another, uh, one and four and then down to one and two, of those four and then down to two, how many soldiers actually die or lose a wound, lose an appendage due to an infection? Because if it's not you know, a, a large number, you know, what, what are we looking at statistically for that number? It's not easy to find those exact statistics, <clears throat> but I will say that there are, um, there are pretty uh, legitimate claims that Infection is the number one cause of post-injury death right now in the military hospitals. Um, it's also the number one cause of hospitalization. So solving that problem does make an impact from what I've seen in the data. Any amb ambient temperature limits or ranges that this is most effective or least effective? Like if it's very cold or very hot? It's a good question. Um, I would say technically that that's definitely something we need to validate. But with regard to um, to anything where you're not experiencing freezing, you know, if it's actually in use, obviously you're not going to drift too far away from, you know, 90, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so. Um, so I wouldn't see any real concerns there in, in terms of efficacy. There's, there's no, um, there's no heat-based or temperature-based portion of the effect. I, I'm probably more concerned about doing the environmental testing on shelf life, to be honest. Yes, sir. Have you looked at um, when the, uh, the chemical is exposed to uh, immune cells, like white blood cells? Does it spike because it's got this agent now, this chlorine, does that cause any impact on anything other? You mentioned that you sprayed it with this biostatin before, but um, how does it impact like, your immune, but you know, if an infection gets in, I have a spike in my white blood cell count as it right. of the infection. Does the exposure to this chemical create a similar type of effect? We haven't seen that. Um, all the cells that we've tested, we've tested fibroblasts, we've tell, tested epidermal cells. We haven't specifically tested our compound um, against, uh, uh, you know, some of the the cells related to, you know, the, the immune response, like you said. But there's, there hasn't, we haven't seen any any negative uh, toxicity uh, towards any eukaryotic cell. Uh, so, um, so no, I guess that's the best I can answer. Is there like a level of the, you talked about the, the chlorine storage right. uh, uh, impacts. Is there a level of chlorine level that it's uh, safe for the body that we know of or how we test it, whatever? Yeah, absolutely there is. You know, the body is, is constantly generating its own chlorine. In fact, the immune response uses hypochlorous acid in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to, um, to attack uh, threats. Uh, and so there's, there's chlorine, you know, everywhere. So I noted in uh, 
the book here, you received a number of sibers. Is this the same technology that you received a sibber on for the biologically derived targeted antifungals for textile applications? Actually, no, that's different. We're, we're looking at a fungal extract that's a peptide. Okay. Um, so totally different. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We do have some samples here if you'd like to see 